All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James over here with you. So glad that you're with us and hope that you're ready for a study from God's Word. We are, this is a live calling program, and if you want to be a part of the program, I'm going to give you the phone numbers where you can call in to be a part and participate. Maybe you have Bible questions or comments or you have a, uh, want to add something to the discussion of the lesson that we're going over tonight. Feel free to do that. The phone numbers are area code 336. 427-9696, that's 427-9696, 427-WMYN, or 627-9563, that's 627-9563, 627-WLOE, give us a call, that's area code 336, if you'd like to be a part of the program. Uh, friends, this is uh, 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 a time when we're going to be discussing uh, some valuable information uh, some things you probably didn't know. I don't know. Uh, you may not think this is part of the a Bible lesson. Where does this fit in with the Bible? But, uh, you know, have you ever thought about global warming? Do you know why it's so rampant? Why people are so buying into global warming, climate change, however you want to call it? Well, what, do you, what do you think about that? Well, friends, this is what I want you to consider. I want you to consider the fact that it could be that it's a lack of knowledge about some things. And so what we're going to do tonight is we're going to be talking about really some things that can help you uh, enlighten you, maybe some things you didn't think about, and then apply it to the Bible. There may be some things that you think you knew that aren't in the Bible, maybe some things you thought you had a grasp on that you really didn't. And we're going to start off by looking at things like global warming. Uh, you might say, well, I'm going to see how you fit this in. Well, that's fine. We'll do that very thing. Let me tell you something about a word of the Lord. It's brought to you by the Church of Christ. We meet at 250 the Boulevard in Eden, North Carolina. Uh, we meet Sundays at 9 a.m. for Bible study, 10 a.m. for worship, Thursdays at 7 p.m. for uh, uh, Bible study. And if you want to be a part of those uh, assemblies, you're more than welcome, friends. We, we put all our scriptures up on the board, on the screen. If you have a Bible question, we'll give you a Bible answer for it. I mean, it's, we're the people that like to study the Bible. Your friends in the Church of Christ, we want you to, to know that we are interested in what God has to say on the matter, and we'll always give you a word from the Lord when you ask a question. Um, and so that's, that's how you can uh, be with us, 250 the Boulevard, Sundays at 9, 10, and Thursdays at 7. If you want to reach me, 276-340-2653, that's 276-340-2653, that's my cell number. You can uh, call me anytime, text me, whatever. I'm, I'll be glad to, to hear from you. And uh, if you want to use that number to be on the program, we can, we can do that as well. I have my phone right here, 276-340-2653, or 336-427-3653. 9696 or 627 9563. Any of those will work. A word from the Lord at gmail.com is my email address. A word from the Lord at gmail.com. Uh, drop me a line and give me a Bible question. We might do a whole lesson on it. Maybe something you haven't uh, uh, heard a lesson about. Maybe you want some more information on it. We'll, we'll do a lesson on it, talk about it, and give you a word from the Lord on that subject matter. Now, friends, let's get back to this idea of global warming. You said, what, what do you mean, global warming? Well, friends, did you ever stop and think that uh, the reason why people accept things is maybe just because they've heard it and they never stopped to think, is it really true? And so really what, what has, what's happening is they're ignorant about some things. And ignorance, you know, there's a saying, ignorance is bliss, and, it, and it's really not. I mean, whoever said ignorance is bliss was pretty ignorant. And uh, whoever said that what you don't know can't hurt you uh, was doubly ignorant because that's a very harmful statement in and of itself. And so ignorance on a lot of things. Now, there's some things you might be ignorant of and it won't really bother you. I mean, if you, uh, I don't know how to uh, build a nuclear rocket and I don't think that that's going to hurt me in my life. I can't do brain surgery, so I don't really feel like that's hurting me. But ignorance on some things can cause some damage. I mean, if you don't, if you're ignorant about what lights, uh, what lights mean on your car, you know they're actually called idiot lights. But if a light comes on in your car and 
you don't pay attention to it, or you say, well, I don't know what that means, I'm just going to keep driving. Well, that's going to be harmful. And so ignorance is a very dangerous thing. It's a very dangerous thing. I want you to listen to what uh, Martin Luther King said. Now, Martin Luther King is um, um, very, a renowned you know, civil rights activist, and I think he did some good things as far as uh, equality is concerned. But listen to the statement that he said, and I, I, I would agree with this. He said, nothing in the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. Nothing in the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance. People, you can, you can be sincere about a lot of things, but if you don't know, if you don't know the facts, then what good is it? You can say, well, I'm sincere. I really, really, really believe this. Well, friends, that, that doesn't really help you in the long run. You can say, well, I, I really and truly genuinely believe this, okay? But does that really uh, help the, change the facts? You know, how you feel about things is not really important. Facts are what matter. And so, and facts don't really care about your feelings, as uh, one fellow said. So, we're really concerned about facts and not being ignorant of the facts. But ignorance or a lack of knowledge on, on important matters is really... What, uh, uh, what we need to be concerned about. And so if we have knowledge, if we, if we have some knowledge, it's going to bring awareness. It's going to bring perspective, um, maybe even motivation, cause you to, to do some things differently once you have some knowledge of these things. And so I, you know, I want you to consider, is it the case that you are truly knowledgeable about all the things that, uh, that it's important that you know about? Now, you say, well, James, you, you, say, you start talking about climate change, global warming. What do you mean by that? Well, I'm going to use that for an example. I'm going to use that for an example. Climate change. Now, uh, you know, we're told the polar caps are, are melting. Uh, you know, the, the, the north and south poles are getting smaller. The polar bears are, are dying and, you know, drowning. And you, we see pictures of... You know, a polar bear swimming out in the in the ocean and so oh he's he's drowning, he's swimming, swimming. Polar bears, they are excellent swimmers. But yet we hear a narrative that says, Well, the polar caps are melting and we're we're burning up our our climate, our our, our world is getting smaller, or, you know, water levels are rising, seas are are getting uh deeper, ocean levels are rising and Tornadoes and hurricanes and all this is all climate change and global warming, El Nino and whatever. But friends, people believe that because that's what they hear every day. And if you talk to someone on the street, I mean, they're, oh yeah, climate change, that's, that's a real thing. I mean, we had a, a vice president uh, a few uh, years ago that made billions of dollars, you know, <laughs> writing a book and making a movie on Global warming, the inconvenient truth, and really what Al Gore's book was really about, it was really a, a, a inconvenient lie, but no one stops and checks it. And those that do are scoffed at it. Now, let me give you some facts. You say, well, James, I know everything there is about it. I, I hear it all. I, I know climate change is real. Well, let me give you some facts. Uh, did you know that the polar ice is not receding? According to NASA, they actually confirm and admit the polar caps are not receding. Uh, in as 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 recent as as uh, 2015, May of 2015, uh, updated data from NASA satellite instruments reveal that the Earth's polar caps have not receded at all since the satellite instruments began measuring the ice caps in 1979. Since the end of 2012, moreover, total polar ice extent has largely remained above the post-1979 average. So there's more ice, on average there's more ice in 2012 than there was in 1979 when they started taking these measurements. Uh, updated data contradict one of the most frequently asserted global warming claims, that is, that global warming is causing the polar ice caps to recede. It's just not true, friends. The polar ice caps are, caps are not receding. I, uh, you can look at satellite images. I, I'm looking at a picture here of satellite image, uh, how the polar ice cap 
from August 2012 increased. It increased. It grew by almost a million square miles, 920,000 square miles in a year. No, it increased 920,000 square miles. It's unbelievable how it looks. And yet we're told, well, it's receding. We're told, yeah, it's a global warming. And so my point is, friends, people hear that. They hear they hear the so-called, the quote-unquote facts that there's a such thing as global warming, but no one really checks it out. No one really looks at it. No one says, well, let's, let's, let's be a little critical of that. The scientists all tell us, right? The, 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 uh, the powers that be or the authority figures that know, the people in the know, they're the ones who believe it. Therefore, we should believe it too. Friends, just because someone with a PhD or a doctorate of his name says something is the fact doesn't mean that it is the case. But what you don't hear is you don't hear the facts. Now, let me ask you this. Did you know this? Did you know that the co-founder of the Weather Channel denies global warming? Yeah. Uh, uh, John Coleman, he, he denies he denies global warming. He says it's a farce. It's a scam. But yet, when when someone reputable like like uh, Mr. Coleman says that, he, uh, um, you know, he's he scoffed at. He's ridiculed. He, you know, he doesn't, he's not given the, the time of day. This is what um, Mr. Coleman said. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is what Mr. Coleman said uh, in a uh, uh, interview uh, just a couple of years ago. Uh, he said this. He said, there are 9,000 PhDs and 31 scientists who have signed the petition that says it's not a significant greenhouse gas. Um, it's, it's a teen itsy bitsy, but in greenhouse gas, but it's not in any way significant. And we are sure of it. It's not like something I made up or just thought up. I've studied and studied and studied it. He goes on to say, and Roger Revelle, the great scientist who wrote that paper back in 1957 with Hans Seuss, changed his mind a decade later and said, quote, wait a minute, I think we are wrong. Don't anybody panic. I don't think there's any global warming. Now, Roger Revelle had a student in one of his science classes, and that student's name was Al Gore. Al Gore had one science class with Dr. Roger Revell, and he bought into global warming. But then when Roger Revell says, no, it's not the case, Al Gore said he's the man senile. You know, now he changes to him. Why? Because it doesn't fit what everybody else is saying. And so the people that are advocating this say, well, we want you to be willfully ignorant of it. You know, we want you to be willfully ignorant. Well, one reason why people want the masses ignorant of things like global warming is because there's money to be made. I mean, um, you know, Al Gore's made a billion dollars off of, off of so-called climate change. And every, every time he's he spoke, it seemed like there's been a, a blizzard. You know, as a matter of fact... Um, uh, I think the average temperature since he brought out his book or his movie has gone down. Uh, so there's really not this this climate change. But, but see, if you say that, say something the contrary, you're you're messing up the narrative. Really, if you just follow the money, you'll find out why people want the majority of people to stay ignorant of these things. And so this is this is what we're talking about. Now, friends, just let's use a little common sense. This is what I tell my I tell my daughter just nearly every day. She goes off to college. She's going out to uh, I know you've heard me say this. She's going out to Rockingham County Community College, and I tell her, you know, all the time, you know, think critically. Don't just take what someone's saying and say, oh yeah, this is this is the truth. Think critically. Think about it. Well, why is that true? How can that be true? Is it the case that it's true? Does it contradict something that you know to be true? And if it does, then let's figure out, does it harmonize? Is there a way to harmonize it as both being true? Or is it the case that, that they're both wrong? And so I'm saying just, just on this global warming thing, just think about this. 
weather forecasters, they can't even tell you what's going to happen for certain next week. All right? Uh, you know, it's going to rain. Is it going to rain? Well, they might get that right. They, well, they see a storm front coming through, so we have a problem with some rain. But I, there's been times when they forecast we're going to get snow and we didn't get a lick. I mean, I remember a few years ago, they forecast that we were going to get nine inches of snow and we got 10 inches of sunshine. I mean, it didn't snow a lick. And then this this last big snowstorm that came through, they were calling, well, we're going to get one or two inches. We got eight or seven, seven inches. So, so they, they can't tell you what's going to happen in the next, next week or next month. Why then should I believe them when they say this is what is going to happen in the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years? See that? Just, just common sense says, well, they can't predict what's going to happen tomorrow. So why would I believe them when they're saying the whole world is going to uh, burn up and melt, <clears throat> you know, in 10, 20 years? It's just not happening. And so all we have to do is, is just do a little common sense. Now you say, well, James, what does that have to do with the Bible? Here's my point, friends. You know, the Bible can shed some light on some things that, that you might not think ever, that it ever would. In, in Genesis chapter 8, in verse 22, when uh, Noah, you know, he's coming off the ark, the Bible says in Genesis 8 and verse 20, and Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings unto the uh, burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. Now notice the next verse, verse 22. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Now, that's what God said. That's what God said. Summer and winter, uh, hot and cold, day and night shall, shall not cease. Now, I want you to consider what, uh, what the environmentalist that want to advocate global global warming says. This is what uh, former president, former vice president Al Gore said. He said, starting in 1970, there was a precipitous drop off in the amount and extent and thickness of the Arctic ice cap. It has diminished by 40 percent in 40 years, and there are now two major studies showing that within the next 50 to 70 years, in summertime, it will be completely gone. In other words, there were the one many eyes there. Wrong. Wrong. He, he was wrong about that. You know why? Because he's not putting into practice simple facts that we have from the Bible. Now, friends, I'm saying if, if ignorance about something like global warming can be so greatly overlooked and missed by so many people, what does that say about ignorance about the Bible in other things that are more important to your life. See? You say, well, James, uh, you know, global warming is not important in my life anyway. Well, think about this. Maybe it is. Uh, did you know that, um, let's see, did you know that the U.S. spends $1.5 trillion a year to reduce global warming? Now think about that. 1.5 trillion on global warming. Now, we can't build a wall to keep bad guys out of our country, but we can spend money to reduce a so-called global warming that's just not going to happen. See the problem there? When people convince you of something that's, that's not real, and get you to buy into it, it costs you. It costs you money, and it could cost you even more than that. Now, let's think about something that's even more important that you might not know about and how ignorance can hurt you, how ignorance can hurt you. Let me get your phone numbers. 
One more time, 336 is the area code. Phone number is 427-9696. That's 427-WMYN. Or 627-9563-627-WLOE. 276-340-2653 if you want to call uh, on my personal phone. Now, friends, I, I use that illustration about global warming to show you that you might be ignorant of these things, but what about something that's more important? Hosea 4 and verse 6, this is what God said. He said, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Friends, ignorance is destructive. Knowledge, knowledge is in, is 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 beneficial. It's uh, informative. It's actually a, a defense, if you will. And so, ignorance about the Bible is what actually can cause you can cause more damage. Will cause more damage than being ignorant about global warming. I mean, you might you might say, well, James, I I couldn't care less about global warming. Okay, fine. Your tax dollars are going to it. Your tax dollars are going to to fight it when it's not really a fight. But do you care about your ignorance about the Bible? You say, well, James, I'm not ignorant about the Bible. I read the Bible every day. I've heard people say all the time, I, I read the Bible every day. I read the Bible all the time. Well, that's good. But, friends, just because you read the Bible all the time doesn't mean that you're not ignorant of the Bible. I mean, there's a lot of things that people do on a regular basis and that they, they have ignorance about what they're actually doing. I mean, think about that. Have you ever done something over and over and over, and then you realize, I've been doing this wrong? You know, I, I've been doing this wrong. Um, I asked the man that does my taxes one year. I, you know, I've asked him, I ask him almost the same question every year. It doesn't seem like I'm doing it right. You know, I'm trying to give him this information. I said, now, are you sure? I'm doing yeah, you're doing it right. That's, that's exactly right. Okay, it doesn't feel right. doesn't seem right. Yeah, I can't wrap my, my mind around it, but I'm doing it the way he says I should do it because he's the man that knows the tax law. Okay, well, I guess I could spend the time and dig into the tax law, figure it out for myself, and I, I've tried. And on some things, I've convinced myself that, yes, I'm doing it right. But what about the Bible? Friends, do you realize that the people that killed Jesus were people that knew the Bible? Uh, I mean, let's think about it. Who killed Jesus? Now, Pilate says in Matthew 27 and verse 18, in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 18, the Bible says that Pilate knew that for envy they had delivered him. So he knew that it was envy that caused them to bring Jesus to the, to the trial and eventually, you know, called, led to his crucifixion. But listen to what Peter says. In Acts 3, verses 14 through 17, Acts chapter 3, beginning in verse 14, this is what, what the people, uh, the Jews uh, there are being told by, by Peter. He says, Ye denied the Holy One and the just, that's Jesus, he said, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. Ye killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof ye are, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Now, now listen carefully. Listen what you, this is what Peter says. And now, brethren... I wot, uh, that I know, I know that through ignorance ye did it as did also your rulers. Do you mean to tell me that the people, and especially the rulers, they didn't know that this was the Messiah? Or that they couldn't have known this was the Messiah? Jesus fulfilled all the prophecies that were written about him. Jesus fulfilled all the prophecies that were written about him, that were written uh, about him, uh, in Luke twenty-four. In Luke twenty-four, uh, 
he, he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Jesus fulfilled everything that was that was uh, uh, spoken of about him in the Old Testament. He fulfilled it all. And these people, they knew the law. I mean, remember, remember when Jesus was born? And the wise men came and they were asking, Where is he that's going to be born, King, you know, King of the Jews? And how did what what did what did uh, Herod do? Herod consulted the 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 scribes, right? Herod sent, and he said, Let, "Let's find out where where he's supposed to be born." He called the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, and they said, "This is Matthew two, uh, about verse uh, five. They said unto him in Bethlehem in Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and they quote Micah five. So they knew where Jesus was supposed to be born. So they knew the scripture. They knew the Old Testament. They knew the law talking about Jesus. But yet they still are said to be ignorant of Jesus. So here's my point. My point is you can say, well, I know the Bible. I listen to the Bible. I read the Bible. I hear the preacher. The preacher, he uses the Bible. So I know it frontward, backward, sideways. That doesn't mean you're not ignorant of it. That doesn't mean that you are not applying it right. You can be just as ignorant of the Bible, reading it every day, as someone who doesn't read it every day. And so ignorance, you know, ignorance can come from individuals who know something. I mean, let's look again. Let's, let's take another example. Here you have a man um, named Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus. Now, do I need to remind you who Saul of Tarsus was? Do I need to remind you how well-versed he was? Uh, if we'll look, let's just take the time. Let's just look in, uh, I'm going to say Philippians uh, chapter 3 and uh, verse 4. He said, if any, man th if any other man think that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I am more. Now listen, he's going to give his pedigree. He said, How I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching righteousness which is in the law, blameless. If anybody kept the law, it was Saul of Tarsus. If anybody knew the law, it was Saul of Tarsus. He was raised at the feet of Gamaliel, who was a doctor of the law. He knew, he knew the Old Testament, frontwards and backwards, sideways. Yet, yet when it came to Jesus, when it came to Jesus, you remember this? There was great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were scattered abroad throughout all the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. That's Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Saul made havoc of the church, entering into the houses, into every house, and hailing men and women, committing them to prison. Acts 8 and verse 3. Here's Saul of Tarsus. He's persecuting the church. He's, he's finding Christians and he's putting them in jail. He's, he, he's um, bringing them to court, bringing them to trial, and even voting to put them to death. Acts chapter 9. Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus for the synagogue, to the synagogues that if he found any of this way, whether they be men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined around him, about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, and said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and shall be told thee what thou must do. Now, here's my point. Saul of Tarsus, a man who knew the scriptures. He knew the, he knew the Old Testament. I mean, if anybody knew the Old Testament, it was it was Saul of Tarsus. I mean, if anybody wanted to keep the law, it was Saul of Tarsus. I mean, in Galatians one, in verse thirteen, he says to the Galatians, "You've heard of my manner of life, my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited." 
in the Jews' religion above many mine equals in my own nation, being more exceeding zealous of the tradition of my fathers. I mean, he was, he was the top dog. Yet, yet this is what he says. This is what he says in his letter to Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. He said, I thank Jesus Christ, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. How could Saul of Tarsus be ignorant? Knowing what he knew. Knowing the scriptures like he knew them. How could he do it in ignorance? That's my point, friends. You can say you would know the Bible frontward, backward, sideways. You may know it like the back of your hand. But that doesn't mean you're not ignorant of some things. There are some people, I, I mean, I know there's some people that can quote the scripture. Boy, they can quote the Bible. That's fine. But just because you can quote the scripture, I mean, that doesn't mean you know it. I mean, the devil can quote scripture. Now, was the devil ignorant of God's plans? Oh, yeah. <laughs> he didn't understand God's plans. So just because you know what the Bible says doesn't mean that you're not ignorant. And that's my point, friend. Ignorance is dangerous. Paul says ignorance is what caused him to persecute Christ and persecute the church of Christ, the church that Christ established. It was ignorance. So ignorant in unbelief. He did it ignorantly in unbelief. Now, let me just say this. Friends, you may hear someone say something uh, from the scripture and it doesn't agree with what you believe. Now, you could be ignorant because you don't believe it. Your, your unbelief is keeping you ignorant. Are you willing this to, be, to remain ignorant is what's causing you to remain unbelieving. And so, here's what you need. You, you need some knowledge. You, you need someone to help you see the scripture and put it all together. The sum of God's word is truth. And that's really what, you know, the business I'm in. I'm, I'm in the business of, of bringing in knowledge. I'm in the knowledge-giving business. Fighting ignorance. In 2 Chronicles 15, verse 1, the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Obed, of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa and said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while ye be with him. If ye seek him, he will be found of you, but if ye forsake him, he will forsake you. Now, for a long season, Israel had been without the true God and without a teaching priest, and without law. See, friends, when you go for a period of time without being taught the law of God correctly, you're without God. Now, there, there, there's a need for knowledge. There's a need for knowledge. There's a need for someone to teach you. Someone to give you some information. And that's why, that's why we've got the phone lines open. That's why we say, look, email me, text me, call me. You know why? Because I can assure you, friends, there are some questions that your preacher won't an answer. Your preacher doesn't want you to ask, doesn't want you to be concerned about, and really it's because he wants you to remain ignorant. He wants you to remain ignorant. Uh, and that, But, you know, I, I, don't, I don't hear any other person on radio, TV, or whatever, saying, call and give me an answer. Call and, and ask me a question. But you can call me. You can call me. Area code 336-427-9696 or 627-9563. 427-WMYN or 627-WLOE. You can ask me a question. Call me, text me, whatever. And we'll answer it. 
All right? So, so because we're in the knowledge-giving business, we're, we're trying to fight ignorance. Trying to fight ignorance. Now, this is what I want you to consider, friends. Listen to what Peter says in 2 Peter 1, verse 5. 2 Peter 1, verse 5. Peter says, Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. You have to add knowledge in order to fight ignorance. All right, the opposite of ignorance is knowledge, and so the way that so the way that you uh, you fight that is you increase your knowledge. Now, there's some some folks will say, "Well, you just can't know everything." You know, you, you just can't know the truth. How, how do you know? How do you know? Friends, the the Apostle John wrote four books. He wrote the Gospel of John. Uh, first, second, and third John. And you can take your concordance, take your concordance, and just look up the word no. Just look up the word no. By my count, there's 99 times, 99 times in those four books, John says no. He uses the word no. Like John 8, verse 32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, friends, how is it how is it that you can know something? How is it, why is it John says you can know something if it's impossible to know it? See, what that tells me is John is telling us we can have some knowledge. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What is the truth? Well, John tells us in John 17, 17, he says that Jesus prayed, Sanctify them with thy truth, thy word is truth. So the more of God's word I know, right, the freer I am. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You shall know God's word, and it will make you free. So you can know something. You can know something. I think I heard, uh, I think it was Glenn Beck the other day. He, he, was, he made some comment about uh, certainty, and he said, you know, uh, couldn't be certain about something. I, I, I'm, I know I'm not getting the quote exactly right, but I remember thinking to myself, "Well, are you certain about that, friends? If 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 you can be certain that you can't be certain, then you just proved yourself wrong. And if you say that you cannot know something, that it's impossible to know what God's will is, how do you know that? I mean, how can you know it?" But the fact that we can know it means that we can dispel ignorance. We can get rid of ignorance. We can move it out of the way. Now, in John 6 and verse 44, this is the key to getting rid of ignorance. The key to getting rid of ignorance is to be taught. John 6 and verse 44, listen to this. Jesus said, no man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, you may hear some of your religious neighbors use this. You may even say this. I've heard people say it to me. Well, has God drawn you? Well, if I have knowledge about how God draws people, then I can answer that question. And I know how God draws people. See, some people think that God draws people by some warm, fuzzy feeling or some operation of, of the Holy Spirit and nudging and bumping and whatever. But the very next verse tells us and explains to us about being drawn. All right? Look, look at it again. Let's look at the context. Now, if you've got your... I'm telling you, friends, if you've got your Bible out, look these up or write down the Scriptures... And uh, you can, you know, go back and study them again. But John 6 and verse 44, John 6 and verse 44, Jesus said, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I'll raise him over the last day. Now, I have to ask the question, how, how are we drawn? The very next verse says, It is written in the prophets, They shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard, and hath learned of the Father, cometh unto me. So I'm trying to know how do I come to Jesus? 
No man can come to Jesus except the Father draw him. How, do, how does that happen? Well, the scripture said everybody has to be taught of God. How are you taught of God? Every man therefore hath heard and hath learned. When you hear and you learn, then you're taught of God. That means you're taught. Being taught is you hear something and you learn it. Then Jesus said, if, you're, if you hear it and you learn it, you come to me. So how am I, how do I, how do, am I drawn to Jesus? I heard of God. I, I was taught. I heard and, was, and learned it. Or I was taught. And that's how I got to Jesus. Friends, come to Jesus is not getting down on a mortar bench. Come to Jesus is not a warm, fuzzy feeling where someone beating you on the back saying, pray through, pray through, pray through. That's not coming to Jesus. Where, where did you ever hear that? Being taught of God is how you come to God, how you're drawn to God. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14. Here's what he says. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14. He said, whereunto he called you by our gospel. We're called by the gospel. We're drawn by the gospel. We're educated. We, we hear the gospel and we learn. And that's how we draw close to God. That's why Paul said in Galatians 1, Galatians 1 and verse 6, he said, I marvel your soul soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Someone comes and teaches you something different, they're, they're, they're pulling you away, but the gospel pulls you closer. So how am I drawn to Christ? How am I, how am I, how am I drawn to, uh, yeah, to Christ? I'm, I'm taught. What does it mean to be taught? You hear and you learn to the Father, and then you come to Christ. So when you hear and you learn, that's how you're, you're being drawn. And so that's why it's so important that you, that you have knowledge. Friends, listen, knowledge is what protects you. I, I don't want you to walk around ignorant. I don't want you to, want you to walk around and be, be duped and to be hoodwinked and swindled and cheated. Knowledge is a defense. Knowledge is a defense. And the more knowledge you have, the more knowledge you have, the, the, the better off you are. I mean, think about it. You know, there's anybody who's watched Saturday morning cartoons knows that um, uh, uh, knowledge is power. You know, the more you know. I mean, there was, there's public service announcements. They still put them on TV. The more you know, the more you know, the more you know. And you can have... You know, all kinds of, uh, uh, of knowledge about different things. But if you really want uh, the great defense, you need knowledge of God's word. I mean, Solomon said, Solomon said, wisdom is a defense and money is a defense. But the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. You say, well, he's got a lot of money. He's got a defense. Well, yeah, it may defend him in court. But it won't stand him before when he stands before the judgment seat of Christ. What's going to defend you there is having a knowledge of God's word. That's what protects you. That's your that's your defense. In Second Corinthians, Second uh, Corinthians chapter two, verse eleven, Paul said uh, he was worried about the Corinthians. He said, "Lest Satan should get an advantage of you, for we are not ignorant of his devices." Friends, you realize that ignorance about God's word is really what makes people do stupid things. Now, people say, well, James, don't say stupid. Well, I think not being able to say stupid is, well, it's stupid. I mean, it's a good word. So I'm going to use it. But people act very stupidly when they don't have knowledge of God's word. They behave, they behave crazily, too, because they don't have knowledge. Ignorance is what allows people to take advantage of you. Now, friends, I want you to think about this. Ignorance is what allows people to take advantage of you. You say, James, well, well, what do you mean by that? What, what do you mean by that? Well, listen to, listen to some of these things. 
have you ever have you ever seen you might have seen this this was a couple years ago there was a woman who sold a grilled cheese sandwich on eBay for twenty eight thousand dollars because supposedly it had the Virgin Mary's face on it twenty eight thousand dollars for a grilled cheese sandwich and uh, from what I'm looking at here, it was a 10-year-old sandwich. An online casino won the eBay auction for a 10-year-old snack of grilled cheese sandwich for $28,000. Now, I don't know who was more ignorant. The person that thought they saw Mary's face in a grilled cheese sandwich or the person that actually shelled out $28,000 for a 10-year-old sandwich. I mean, you can't even eat it, right? I mean, it's 10 years old. Who's going to eat that thing? So, you see what I'm saying? So, but, but, who does that? Why is that even happening? Why, why is that even happening? It's because people have been told, oh, this, that, that's a picture of the Virgin Mary. Friends, can you tell me what, what Mary looks like? There is not a soul living that knows what Mary looks like. I don't care what the Catholic Church says. They don't know what, Je what Mary looks like. They don't know what Jesus looks like. Here's another example. Uh, Jansville, Wisconsin. Uh, a woman named Faith found the image of the Virgin Mary, complete with halo, staring back on a chunk of firewood. She was about to burn the firewood in the wood stove when the image of the center of the wood caught her eye. She described that the Virgin Mary image had a halo of light, lighter colored wood around her head. The firewood was acquired by GoldenPlace.com from an eBay auction for $99. Really? Really? So, what, what, is, what is, again, what does Mary look like? What, what does she look like? And, it's just a piece of wood. Uh, so when when people see these things, when people see these things, it's really because they've been what they've been they've been told that this is what you're looking at. Uh, what this is is called. Uh, this is a, a condition called uh, pareidoli, I believe it's if I'm pronouncing it right. And it's where the mind sees things that look familiar. In other words, the, the mind wants to make patterns of things. And that's why when you see, you know, you, you see images in things that aren't really there. Uh, you can see all kinds of pictures of these on, on the on the internet, right? Uh, the taillights of a car look like eyes and the bumper looks like a smile. That's what that is. Now, friends, am I supposed to, every car I see and it looks like there's a two eyes and a smile, a smiling face or two eyes and a, and a mouth, am I supposed to say, oh, you know, I, I believe that's Jesus looking back at me. No. That's just how my mind works. But because people are ignorant, of the fact that, that your mind is seeing these things, it, it, it makes these things. Here's another one. Jesus, uh, a man in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, uh, Phoenix, Arizona dentist and his staff claimed that a dental x-ray done at their office contained an image resembling Jesus Christ. The dental x-ray was done for the teeth of a devout Christian. Now, I wonder, I just really wonder if an atheist had done that, if, if the, Jesus had appeared in the, in the x-ray. I don't know. The image of Jesus was discovered when the x-ray was developed. How silly. No one has seen Jesus. Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 8, the last person to see Jesus was him. He was the last to see. Last of all, he was seen to me as one born out of due season, out of due time. So when people say, well, I see Jesus, I see Mary, you know what they're doing? They're showing their ignorance. They're showing their ignorance. And it's this kind of ignorance that people that people uh, prey on.
P-R-E-Y, not P-R-A-Y. People take advantage of this kind of ignorance. That's why, friends, that's why the preacher can get you to do things and say things and act a certain way because you don't have knowledge of the Bible. Now, listen to what Paul said. In Romans 1 verse 13, Paul said, Now I would not have you ignorant. Paul does not want people, he didn't want his brethren running around without some kind of knowledge. Knowledge about how things should be done. Knowledge about what God's will was. But yet there's a lot of people running around, that's what they are. They, they're very ignorant of what the Bible says. In 1 Corinthians 12 verse 1, listen again to what Paul says. He says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. But if there was ever somebody that was ignorant, it was the church at Corinth about spiritual gifts. And today we have people who run around and say, well, I can speak in tongues. I can jib-jab this, jib-jab that. I can heal the sick and I can raise the dead. You know, they don't raise the dead. That, that's one thing they don't claim because they know it's impossible. But they'll run around and say they can speak in tongues. They have gifts of healing and they've got uh, gifts of discerning spirits and they're all kind of stuff. But friends, they're ignorant about the purpose of those things. Miracles were for the purpose of confirming the word. Mark chapter 16, verse 20. The signs that were following them that believe were to demonstrate that the person doing the speaking, that the person doing the speaking was uh, speaking on God's behalf. God was with that person. In Mark 16, verse 20, I'm going to get that scripture up here. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. That's the purpose of miracles, to confirm the word. And so friends, the reason why I'm doing this, why I'm opening the phone lines, why I'm talking to you about these things is because I'm trying to put the silence, the ignorance. And that's what Peter said. First Peter 2 and verse 15, he said, For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Friends, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm really trying to save you. I'm trying to help you. But the product of ignorance comes up with all kinds of crazy doctrines. Listen to this. Tithing. Uh, tithing. The Southern Baptist Convention. This is what the Southern Baptist Convention says about tithing. They said, it is an essential part of our worship to God. Tithing predates the law of Moses and is affirmed in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. No, it's not in the New Testament. It's not affirmed in the New Testament. It's recorded in things recorded in the New Testament before the new law came into effect. But that doesn't mean that we tithe today. Like the tithing of your, of your uh, 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 herbs and spices and things like that. Jesus and uh, Luke eleven forty two, you know they said Jesus said you give a uh, you know you give a tithe of your of your, your your mint and your cumin and your herbs and things like that, but you you leave you leave the weightier matters of the law undone. So they're wrong about that. Just because it predates the law of Moses doesn't mean that we still we still tithe. But but that's what everybody that wants tithing says, and they want you to be ignorant of the fact that the Old Testament has been done away. Listen to what they say. This is from the Southern Baptist Convention. The scripture equates failure to tithe with robbing God, Malachi 3.8. That's under the old law. No tithing in the New Testament. No tithing in the New Testament. In the New Testament, we're told to give as we've been prospered, give as we purposed in our heart. It doesn't tell us that we have to give a tenth. Really, we're under a better system. We should give more than a tenth. But you can't make people give that. But because people are ignorant of tithing, because they're ignorant of what the Bible says, then the preacher can get them to give and give and give and pass the chicken bucket and pass the plate, pass the hat, every time they come together. Because they're ignorant of what the Bible says on this matter. Southern Baptist Convention. Whereas tithing is essential for kingdom work through the local church and ministries around the world. Whereas the Great Commission, Task Force Report, Southern Baptist 
give just 2.5% of their annual income to the local church, demonstrating the need for Southern Baptists to teach and faithfully obey the biblical man of the time. How about they faithfully teach what the Bible says about giving? But see, I mean, they're, they're, just, they're just wanting more of your money. Listen to this. It says cooperative program giving from the churches has declined significantly from $548 million to $488 million. That's in a two-year span. Uh, reducing support of ministries and missions and ministries by $60 million. Frank S. Page, president of the Southern Baptist Convention Executive Committee, has challenged the Southern Baptist churches to increase their cooperative program giving by at least 1%. All right, well, they, they want you to give. They want you to give, but they won't tell you what the Bible says about giving, they're going to impose the tithe on you. The Bible doesn't say tithing. The Bible says give as you prospered <clears throat> and as you purposed in your heart. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. And 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Here's another one. So friends, we just go on and on and on about this. Because people are ignorant about the Bible, then they will do anything. Here's, here's uh, something from the Osborne Baptist Church in Eden. Night to Shine, sponsored by the Tim Tebow Foundation. Night to Shine, sponsored by the Tim Tebow Foundation, is an unforgettable prom night experience centered on God's love for people with special needs. Now, I don't have a problem doing things for people with special needs. That's great. But a prom night, is that really, is that really part of God's plan for, for anybody, whether they have special needs or otherwise? Here's what it says. He says, once in, it says, once inside... Uh, Night to Shine centers on the complimentary event on a red carpet complete with warm welcome for a friendly paparazzi and crowd. Once inside, guests receive the royal treatment, including hair, makeup stations, shoe shines, corsages, boutonnieres, karaoke, gift bags, photo booth, limo rides, delicious food, and, of course, dancing. Ignorant about what the Bible says about the modern dance. Lasciviousness. Friends, the prom, I mean, you can't, you can't spell the word promiscuous without the word prom. See what we're talking about? We're talking about people promoting something like the world, that the world will do. Everybody else in the world is going out to uh, celebrate the prom, and these kids go out and they take off all their clothes, they go out dancing and rubbing on each other, and the next thing you know, you know, nine months later, they've got a little baby coming along. That's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. And so I'm saying, friend, I'm saying it's ignorance of God's word. Ignorance of God's word is destroying people, and it will cause them to buy anything. It will cause them to do anything. So, oh, but I know God's word. I read it every night, friends. That's ignorance. That's ignorance. And the most important thing that people are ignorant on is salvation. I mean, Jesus said, what is a man profited if he gained the whole world and lose his soul? Matthew 16 and verse 26. But friends, I, I, want, I want to dispel that ignorance. I've only got, what, a minute, a minute and a half? So let me tell you, I want to make sure you're not ignorant of this. Here's what the Bible says about salvation. You must hear the word and believe it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Friends, if you can't find it in the Bible, then you cannot say that it's by faith. You, didn't, you cannot say you heard God say it. God never said anywhere, any time, place, shape, or form, to, to say a sinner's prayer and be saved. He never said go to the mourner's bench. He never said pray through. He never said tell your experience or nothing like that. Faith comes by hearing him by the word of God. You must believe that Jesus is the son of God. John 8 and verse 24, if you believe not that I am he, you'll die in your sins. All right? Now, once you believe that Jesus is the son of God, are you saved? No. You still got to repent. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, except you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Paul commanded all men everywhere to repent. And then be baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2, verse 38. You become a member of the Lord's church, the church of Christ. Acts 2, verse 47. The Lord added to the church daily, such you should be saved. Friends, we love you. That's why we're telling you information that will dispel your ignorance and give you some information that can save your souls. Friends, I'm out of time. I'm out of time. If you want to reach me, 276-340-2653. A word from the Lord at gmail.com. A word from the Lord at gmail.com. 
250 the Boulevard is where you can assemble with the Church of Christ, and we hope that you will come and visit with us. But until next time, friends, always make sure that what you're getting is a word from the Lord.